This evening with the political journalist Isabel Oakshot and the Observer's chief leader writer Sonia Soda. Lovely to see both of you. So to the front pages then, the Daily Express reporting that armed guards have patrolled the Grand National for the first time in a move to protect racegoers in the wake of the Westminster attack. The Guardian is leading with witness accounts of the suspected gas attack in Syria, which has claimed more than 70 lives. The Times reports that Donald Trump is considering military action against the Assad regime in Syria following that chemical attack. The Metro reveals doctors' surgeries are closing at a record rate, with 57 shutting last year. Daily Telegraph also leading with that story, saying the closures have been fueled by a high rate of doctors retiring ahead of tax clampdowns on pensions. Parents pay the price, says the I, after a judge ruled against a father who challenged a fine for taking his daughter on an unauthorized holiday during school term. The Daily Star previews the Grand National Race, saying temperatures are set to be hotter here than Greece, with 23 degrees predicted. While the Daily Mirror has claims from a former detective who fears convicted murderer Peter Sutcliffe may have many more victims. So let's talk more then with Isabel and Sonia, and starting with The Guardian, reporting from the scene of that chemical attack with the dramatic headline, The Dead Were Wherever You Looked. The horror of this continues to, to shock the world. Yes, and I think that there can be few people who haven't been moved by the horrific images that have come out. I mean, these are quite extraordinary, and in some ways, I think the images have been more powerful than what we saw with the other terrible chemical attacks some years ago. Whenever I, um, I'm thinking about this, I can't help thinking back to the um, seminal vote in the House of Commons um, some years ago under David Cameron when our MPs collectively failed to back action in Syria. And President Obama at that time had said the use of chemical weapons was a red line. And we did nothing about it in this country. And that gave President Obama the cover not to do anything about it either. And here we are some years on, and we've got the same situation. Except at that point, and presumably with, with pressure from Russia, um, President Assad did give up his chemical arsenal, or so we presumed. He said he did. Uh, and I think um, there was an uh, expert who was interviewed recently in the last 24 hours or so who was part of the team that went out, um, I, I guess it was a UN team, to remove those weapons. And he was confident that all the declared weapons were removed. But, you know, where are they from if they're not from a cache that was hidden? Mm. So we move to the, uh, the top of the Times there. Trump considers airstrikes on a sad after nerve gas attack. Cruise missiles they're suggesting possibly on their uh, air military bases. Do you think this is becoming inevitable and why has President Trump changed his policy so quickly? Well, I think it's becoming a lot more likely. And I think the big question is, why has Trump, Trump changed his mind so rapidly? Because, you know, just a week ago, people in his administration were saying, you know, there's no prospect of sort of taking any action against Assad. And it clearly is this chemical attack. And what appears to have happened is that Trump saw these pictures and you know, has decided on the basis of that, that that action is needed. Now, I actually, I mean, this is something that Isabel and I agree on. I don't think that there's any good option mm -hmm. in a situation like this. But I think um, the use of chemical weapons is illegal under international law. And what's the point in having international law if there are absolutely no repercussions when somebody uses something as terrible um, as, as chemical weapons? So I think it is important that there is some symbolic action taken and we've had um, you know, people who worked in the Obama administration, for example, kind of speculate about what that very limited sort of intervention uh, might be. But that's not to say there are good outcomes in this. Syria is just so horribly messy. There's just been so much carnage, so many lives lost there over the last kind of, you know, I don't know how many years it's been now since what? It's eight, it's eight, eight years. Like yeah, exactly. Well, since 2011. Yeah. Long time. And, and so, so it, we mustn't be naive. We mustn't think that there are easy solutions. We mustn't think that, that regime change is going to be something that's easy that fixes the problem. But I think there are actions that can be, can be taken from a humanitarian perspective that the West has been too reluctant to take, things like no-fly corridors, for example. And I think we will look back and feel incredibly ashamed, actually, at the lack of action that the West took. And I think, I think many think, of us already do. Absolutely. Um, and I think, I think intervention you know, in the past, like in Iraq, has really sort of uh, you know, 
put the West off intervening again, although it has intervened, obviously, in places like Yemen, and it's been very difficult there. And of course, Iraq and Syria are two completely different situations. So people who say, well, look what happened in Iraq, we mustn't intervene in Syria, I just, mm. I, I just think that's a, a completely Well, that was certainly the Labour Party's argument. view when you yeah, were talking about Yeah, and I think it was a wrong I mean, well, so there are also, argument. there are a couple of other interesting angles to this. One, which is the, um, the messages that Trump was giving out so strongly during his campaign, which were very much anti going anywhere near mm. Syria. You know, America first, this is not one for us. This tells us that pretty much nothing that Trump said during his campaign can be taken as absolute certain guide for what he's going to do in the future. I think the other interesting thing is the rhetoric now about Assad having no place in the future of Syria. And that very much implies uh, America thinking of regime change, really. I don't for a minute think they're going to try to implement regime change, but what is the point of saying that unless you have a plan or, or some kind of idea of how you're going to affect that? Yeah, and I think the other big question is, now I think there'll be a lot of people who sort of see Trump saying what he is and they find themselves in a slightly strange position where they find themselves agreeing with Trump on something, which I think might be quite Novelty. scary for some people. <laughs> but there are also questions, I mean, literally, the administration's policy has changed mm -hmm. in the last, in, you know, in the last 24, 48 hours. Now, that's not generally the way that foreign policy works. It needs certainty. It needs long-termism. It doesn't. It doesn't need. You know, it doesn't work when there are these very unpredictable swings. And so, I think it does raise questions about when you've got the country's, uh, the, the world's most leading, you know, the world's most powerful democracy literally changing its stance you know on a on a daily basis i think that raises questions about the stability of the global order which aren't necessarily specifically about what's going on in syria well rick Tillis and the u.s secretary of state is uh, the work is already underway to amass a global coalition uh, to push for regime change the big concern of course is that you weaken assad's military forces you allow islamic state to flourish once mm. again or at least to claim back some of the territory it is currently losing and until a week ago as you pointed out president trump's avowed intention and his priority was to get rid of Islamic State. So that is one of the changes that uh, that we've seen and one of the risks you, you, you're talking about. Absolutely. But I mean, you know, we can sit here and hand ring about how complicated it all is, which it is. You know, that is why we haven't intervened before. But that should not be a block to actually sending a message that crossing a red line has the gravest of consequences. And it has the gravest of consequences, mm. ought to have the gravest of consequences for the leader of the mm. regime concerned. Yeah. And I think it, you also have to acknowledge, and I think people who are so dead set opposed to intervention they don't acknowledge is that non-intervention has consequences too in the same way that intervention has consequences yes, absolutely and our non-intervention yeah. in 2013 has had consequences terrible ones yeah and the uk ambassador to the un made that quite clear non-intervention does not lead to nothing it leads to suffering exactly. right exactly um, so i've moved to the telegraph britain calls for syria calm as trump talks tough with quotes from boris johnson the foreign secretary well, I don't want Britain to call for calm. I want Britain to call for quite the opposite. I would like our um, foreign office to be quite robust on this. You know, it's all very well just saying, well, we should have an investigation. But I think we actually should be celebrating the fact that Donald Trump is stepping up here. Mm. Was the, it seems to be the UN resolution that is going through the United Nations, whether it will get anywhere, is calling for the logs of Syrian aircraft to find out where they were flying and, and where from. And certainly, uh, the quotes here from Boris Johnson, it is very important to try first to get a new UN resolution. We've kind of been here before, of course, yes, on Iraq so many, many years ago. The difficulty with that. that is that the UN Security Council is paralysed because Russia and China will stand as a block to any action, any significant signal to Assad. And so I think there's a really important question here in the world as we move forward. There's been a real shake-up in the global world order. And to just always rely on the backstop of we need the moral legitimacy legitimacy of the UN. I'm it's sorry, but that doesn't work in today's world. Yeah. Okay, um, let's move on to the uh, or one of the other big stories, certainly for parents, which is featured, actually it's in the Daily Mail as well, um, part of that blacked out as you can see, but uh, now end school holiday rip-offs, as Supreme Court rules children can't miss lessons for family breaks, suggesting what, that the travel industry should get Yeah, is so that is, that that is complete pie in the sky, isn't it? Lovely, wonderful ideal, wonderful dream, as if the school, all the companies that cash in as they do, incredibly exploitatively during school holidays 
are suddenly going to, out of the goodness of their hearts, drop their prices. But is it exploitatively? Is it exploitative? or is supply it and demand. Well, I agree well, with that. But it's That's why than, they won't drop their prices. But it's more than that, isn't it? It pays for the lean times of the year, like November when... Oh, just drop my pen, sorry. <laughs> uh, when people don't go away, you know, you pay for the lean times but by the peak times. That's well, that's a really nice way of looking at it. Look, these are businesses, you know, they, they will charge what they can get away with. I mean, I'm really disappointed by um, this decision by the judges today. You know, this idea that somehow children can't miss a single day of education in order to be with their family to go on a, a treat somewhere, I think is absolutely fallacious. And I really think that... Uh, head teachers should be able to uh, exercise some discretion here. Of course, if there are parents who are routinely taking the mickey by taking their children out repeatedly, well, of course, a head teacher should ban that. But you know, it should be up to parents and head teachers together to make a sensible but you have 30, judgment. You 31, 32 yeah. children. Each one of them goes out for a week. Teacher has to catch up on all of those children, what they've missed throughout the... You know, it's, it would be yeah. a never-ending process of trying to bring people up to speed. It oh, be, I just think that's it's rubbish. You know, it's not yeah. rubbish. But on any day. a primary school, and it is incredibly disruptive when parents take kids out during So why not ban children from getting rating? sick then? They miss a day. Does, well, I mean, children are sick the whole time. Does that leave Isabel. them in the situation? It's about... Being sick is very different to, you know, being yeah, sick. Yeah, but presumably it has the but, same um, consequences as the one that Anna described. Yeah, but you there. can't ban children from getting sick. It, it is, I think it is a problem. Um, it's really, really disruptive for head teachers and for teachers. It impacts on other children's education, not just the, you know, the education of your own child. And yeah, maybe you're taking them off on some amazing educative experience. But if lots of, you know, say half a class is getting that experience, the half of children left in the class, it's not maybe you have half to sit the there class. where so other Think about it. Up. I mean, most parents well, aren't some, gadding around on holiday the whole time. In some schools it will be, in other schools it won't yeah. be. So yeah. what about thinking slightly laterally, like some um, Welsh areas trying to Phasing. put all their inset I... days into one week, like in June, so you can yeah. have a, a week where you can escape the school holiday melee? Well, there are better ways of staggering school holidays. So there isn't this ludicrous peak time in August mm. where everybody has to pay... Except up, people have compete. you know, mixed families, don't they, with you know, relationships and previous children who maybe live in other areas. That's the difficulty. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be tricky things about it, but the structure of our school year mm. come, dates back to the agrarian times where you know, children used to have to go out picking in August, and that's why the school year was structured in the way that really it was. historical yeah, here, aren't you? Yeah. Agrarian times. Well, you're the historian. Yeah. Yes, no, but it's true. I actually wrote a think tank report about this a few oh years ago. Oh my goodness, ago. she's getting really high <laughs> And so, you know, actually, if you did, there's no reason for the structure of our school year. If you did try and stagger the school holidays a bit, that would probably have an impact on prices. And why not do that? And yeah. they do that in Scotland, I think. It is yeah, a completely they different yeah, school year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, think on that, uh, the education department. Uh, still to come, meet the 105-year-old who rode a roller coaster into the record books. Well done him, back in a moment.